Thank you, Dan, for being so timely. I appreciate it. Um, is there a, yeah, there's a quick Okay, um, so I was going to, to talk just briefly on the, um, the, what grew out of the Genomic Medicine Forum meeting that we had in Dallas in, in terms of this Inter-Society Coordinating Committee. Uh, and just to remind you that the goals of the meeting that we had in January, which grew, you know, grew out of the meeting that we had in May, I think, um, in Chicago. So, so each of these meetings really builds on the previous one, and that's why it's so important to get your input as to what our next steps should be. Um, and at the end of the, the third meeting, people said, you know, we really need to address education, particularly of physicians. And so, you know, we felt it would be wise to try to bring together professional societies and other relevant organizations that, that are involved in both setting clinical <coughs> practice guidelines and also developing uh, educational materials for physicians, learn their perspectives on genomic medicine, understand their processes uh, for establishing guidelines, and, and kind of explore how to facilitate the integration of genomic medicine into clinical best practices and physician education. Uh, and we did kind of, I, I think, evolve from focusing more on guidelines into uh, more on education and as we interacted with the societies who who basically you know are, are those the ones that are responsible for for making guidelines but they need to have an educated workforce to be able to implement them so what we did was to try to identify the, the largest and, and seemingly to us most relevant groups um, in professional societies and that uh, that we might bring together in a, in a room like this and we didn't try to capture all of them um, or even a representative sample um, but basically kind of started with those who were willing to you know come come to, to um, uh, Dallas and meet with us in, in January. And that's the list that's shown here, about 10 groups or so. Um, we were asked and have been asked why only doctors. Uh, this says he was different from other doctors. For one thing, he refused to play God, and it doesn't doesn't look good here. Um, and so, so one of the reasons that that we did that is, as you've heard, I think throughout this meeting, um, uh, Nichpeg and other groups have been pretty effective at capturing physicians' assistants and, and reaching out to to pharmacists and to a, a wide variety of nurses and and other groups, uh, as has NHGRI. We haven't really um, until now begun to sort of crack the nut of of dealing with physicians. Uh, and, and part of the reasoning for that, we think, is, is that there wasn't anything that really was kind of ready for prime time for physicians to implement until fairly recently. But now we think we have a, a real opportunity to do that. Um, so we asked the professional societies that were uh, coming and, that within their specialties were among your members, uh, can you describe for us sort of the state of the science regarding genomics and, and practice uh, of genomics with, within your field? Uh, what short and long-term pace of change do you see in the use of genomics? What gaps are there um, in, across leading uh, academic centers, well-informed specialty practices or small practice MDs? Thinking in, in our minds, at least, there was sort of a hierarchy that, that presumably the uh, academic centers might be at the cutting edge of this, whether they were evidence-based or not, at least they might be the furthest along, uh, where the small, small practices might not be. Um. Any needs assessments that they had done, uh, whether patient access to high quality care uh, they feel is going to be um, uh, impaired by the lack of physician genomic literacy, what plans they had to address any perceived shortfalls, uh, specialty board activity that might include genomics in their certification or maintenance of certification processes, um, and how they go about reviewing literature and fashion guidelines for, for using genomics in diagnosis and treatment. So, so each of them was given a list of these questions, much like we gave the federal agencies yesterday, and, and they all had, you know, not enough time. Time to, to try to address them, but they did a, a really nice job in approaching that. Um, and all of the materials for these, these uh, presentations are up on our website, as will all the materials from, from this meeting. Um, but areas of general consensus were that uh, one of the, the major stumbling blocks that, that at least has been perceived is that physicians have been sort of taught that this is a major revolution in medical care. It's going to turn everything on its head, and that is very intimidating to people. And it's also been a bit of a, uh, a letdown because it hasn't turned everything on its head, but, you know, it, it certainly is, is having an impact. Um, so we were strongly urged to present this as an evolution evolution in knowledge rather than a major revolution, and I think that was a, a, a really important message to get across to us, um, and that we should embed genomics education at the point of care when it's needed and only when it's needed, with appropriate clinical decision support, again, when it's needed without overwhelming people and, and without really getting in the way to, to the degree possible of their clinical workflow. We are also urged to utilize other resources uh, in addition to, to things like uh, lectures and seminars and conferences, such as uh, simple che checklists or fact sheets or ethical guidelines, case studies, that sort of thing. Um, and um, there was considerable agreement that we could incorporate genomics into certification and licensing procedures. Uh, we should identify and emphasize appropriate competencies, and there was interest among the societies for doing this, um, and that we should allow so specially tailored training. Actually, this was more a message, I think, to the genetics community. 
um, that uh, in, insisting that that geneticists be sort of certified in in the um, uh, large range of, of rare Mendelian conditions and dysmorphologies and that sort of thing has has acted against getting physicians engaged in genetics. So the oncologists were saying, can't we have sort of an oncologist genomicist um, track where we learn just what's important for for oncology or just what's important for cardiology and and not necessarily have to learn everything about pediatrics or or whatever. And so an interesting thing that I believe um, the college may be looking into. And and I, I might note that there were several um, people in, in involved in that meeting. There are at this meeting, and so I'll, I'll give a heads up to, to Deborah and Bruce and, and a couple of others to maybe comment. When, and Mike Murray, I think I see you. Yeah, I see you back there. <laughs> so, um, so I'll ask on, uh, you to comment in a bit. Areas of concern that were identified including included many of the very things we've heard today about standards for, for data storage and sharing, um, not only sharing among um, uh, physicians groups, but also even getting results back from a lab and being able to interpret them. Liability risks, we've heard that today as well, from extensive genomic testing and getting back results that you really don't know what to do with. Conflict and guidelines across societies, there were a couple of, of rather telling uh, examples of that listed. Uh, interpretation and counseling on, on physician, uh, sorry, on patient-initiated direct-to-consumer testing. And marketing pressures, which we heard about from the, from the military groups, uh, from genetic evaluation companies. Also, in, in kind of reviewing some of the surveys, there were about four groups that had done surveys among their members. Uh, some of them did them in response to, to uh, the, this upcoming meeting, which was, was very gratifying. Um, and they found that even the physicians who were confident in their genomics knowledge uh, felt really reluctant about ordering and interpreting these tests. So, so that's something that we really need to address. Even those who thought genomics were important were only willing to commit one to two hours to education. So one to two hours is not a lot of time, and we need to use it very wisely. And it was also interesting, I think, to, to some of us that the minority of physicians who really thought that family histories were important, um, only a minority of them uh, routinely take a complete three-generation family history. And, and I can tell you, I don't take a complete three-generation family history. Um, I do take a family history. I think it's better than, than most, um, but uh, I don't do it in every patient, so maybe I should. Okay. Um, so what came out of the, the meeting in Dallas then at the end was we need some kind of a conglomeration of these societies where we can continue to share materials and coordinate to, to develop resources in that for physician education without reinventing the wheel and duplicating what everyone is, is doing. Um, and I think uh, Deborah through the, the College of uh, American Pathologists had shown us some really nice educational materials that they have that everybody sort of drooled over and said, we'd love to have access to these. And she said, of course. You're, uh, and we will. Yeah. We, yeah, no, that's great. No, comment uh, when maybe when I get through. So, um, so the charge to this group then that they've kind of agreed on uh, pretty much is to improve the genomic literacy of physicians, and we added other practitioners. So again, focusing on physicians at least to start, and enhance the practice of genomic medicine through sharing educational approaches and and jointly identifying educational needs. And really, the purpose of this group is to facilitate interactions among the professional society. So it's not an advisory group. It's, it's not a, a recommendation group. It really is just a club where people get together and share, uh, share approaches. Um, and it focuses, again, uh, primarily on physicians. We added dentists because dentists really don't have any other home. Um, and it seemed, it seemed like a nice thing to do for them. Um, and, <laughs> and, also, and, and teeth are important. Um, and then uh, uh, hoping soon to, to uh, begin to collaborate or, or expand collaborations with uh, allied practitioners. Practitioners. We recognize that relations to professional societies are very important, that we not overstep any bounds that there may be, and recognizing their primacy in defining practice guidelines and certification requirements for their members. So that is not something that we want to do or should be doing. Um, to support and stimulate the activities of these societies by offering our partnership and available expertise when they want it and, and not when they don't want it. Um, and we, we recognize that we're not intending to assume any, any primacy in these, um, uh, in these interactions at all. Uh, Dan is a, is a long-term vision guy and encouraged us to come up with a long-term vision, so I think this, this one may work as well as any, um, which is recognizing that the technology continues to advance and it will soon make it possible for lots of patients to have lots of their genome characterized and available in their medical record. And, and we see this as, as inevitable, and I think you've heard that during these meetings as well. One, one can debate what the time frame will be and, and what the steps will be to get there, but it's almost um, indubitable that this is going to happen. Um, so 
it seemed to us that if we begin educational efforts now, when the, the body of knowledge that one can implement is relatively limited, so that it's not overwhelming, and then allow the, the understanding of the genome and its application to grow with the practitioner's knowledge of that understanding and, and application would be a good thing. So, so that's why it seemed good to start at this point. And we felt that there were sufficient numbers of clinically relevant findings available currently that would support effective educational efforts so we can get people's attention um, for the use of these variants without, again, scaring them off. Um, we proposed a structure that, that would be each professional society would nominate uh, one person. They could send more than one, but, uh, but you know, we'd like at least one. Uh, and many of them have already done this. Uh, we've asked them if they'd be willing to support the travel of those members, and, and for the most part, they have been able to do that, which is great. There's not a lot of travel. We're anticipating meeting face-to-face -face maybe twice a year at the most. Um, we would invite ad hoc content experts as needed, um, propose that, that we have a, a co-chair who's a professional society representative and, and one that's an NIH person, again, meeting at six-month intervals, and then kind of design a three- to five-year work plan um, with the potential, if it goes well, to, uh, to extend that. This is a list of, of proposed specific activities. I won't read them all because these, these slides I know are very text-dense, uh, uh, but there were a number of them sort of surveying the literature, kind of identifying things that are about ready to be applied, uh, reviewing and disseminating them, having working groups to address a, a number of things, focusing on, on physician competencies and listing what those might be. Um, reviewing professional society guidances on request. I mean, if there were an interest in having another sort of disinterested group uh, look over what professional societies were proposing to put into guidance, we'd be happy to look at that. Um, disseminate some metrics for, for assessing educational programs, uh, sharing those, collaborating with those that are, are working with other allied health providers. Um, and particularly, we had both the um, um, Accreditation Council on, on um, Graduate Medical Education and the Accreditation Council on Continuing Medical Education. So that's, you know, residents, fellows, and practicing physicians. Um, um, very, very engaged, and particularly the ACCME is quite interested in engaging with us in developing materials and, and sharing them throughout uh, physicians' careers. Um, and then um, what we're, we're working on currently is to identify a few activities that we could bring forward in the short term. Uh, again, you want to have a couple of, of early successes. And we asked our, our members to kind of pick among the 10 specific activities we'd identified, maybe five or six or so that, that might be um, things we could move forward on. And the ones that kind of got the highest votes, well, there were four of them. One was on competencies, and you know one could have a working group on competencies that kind of reviews the sources that are available, see what com competencies might fit into current clinical practice, uh, review the existing ones, work with the societies to determine their desires and needs, that sort of thing. Uh, another on educational products where you gather together the educational products that are available, review them, see where the, the duplications are or where the, the synergies and, and make them available in a, in a reasonable way. Um, Engaging specialty boards, so a lot of the society said, you know, what we really need to do is to get the specialty boards from the various, uh, relevant to the various professional societies, really engaged in this. Because uh, what, what physicians will study, given their, their very limited time available for education, is what they have to know in order to maintain their certification. Um, and so far, the specialty boards have been quite interested, particularly the American Board of Medical Specialties, which is kind of an, an umbrella group over 18 or not, maybe it's 20 um, uh, different specialty board groups. and, uh, and they they are, are quite interested as well, so kind of trying to engage them uh, in the most effective way, and, uh, and developing use cases. We've heard about use cases here as well. So, so those seem to be the four working groups that we see as, as you know, being sort of ripe to bring forward, and we're uh, planning to meet in June for the first time. We've had a couple of conference calls of this group where we develop these materials, uh, produce a white paper, which is kind of de rigueur of, uh, of meetings and groups like this, so, um, and kind of move forward from there. And we've even come up with a, a few suggestions of, of how to evaluate and, and um, show success, some of which would be process metrics, like, um, you know, we identify some best practices and disseminate them, we generate competencies or, or estimates of a physician use of these materials, uh, but recognizing that the process metrics were sort of less satisfying than, than actual um, practice improvements, more substantive things like uh, the educational products actually get used, um, and that uh, uh, e there's evidence of improved knowledge and comfort in using genomics. There might be useful papers or even improved clinical practice, which is what we're, we're aiming for. 
So um, I would just close with, uh, with as, of, as of today or, or perhaps yesterday, the, the in white are, are kind of the, the initial groups that we had involved. And, and, uh, and I've added in blue those that have kind of approached us. And, and Deborah came up and said, you know, we really need to have the College of American Pathologists, and they're interested in, in joining. And so they're up as well. Um, and I think with that, I, that's probably all I had. Yeah, so I'll stop there and be happy to take any questions. Oh, yes, Bruce, please comment, uh, and I'll call on, on Mike as well. <clears throat> yeah, so I'll comment specifically on the issue of um, subspecialty training that you raised. Um, the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics has been very interested in creating um, training tracks for, for example, cardiologists or oncologists and various other specialties who, as you point out, don't need to know all the things that or be competent in all the things that a medical geneticist might in order to focus on the area of their, of their interest. It has not been easy um, engaging the American Board of Medical Genetics in that discussion, um, or at least in moving them forward, largely because of the enormous expense of creating an ABMS sort of um, blessed um, subspecialty that involves using the National Board of Medical Examiners to produce an exam and so forth. It's a quite expensive process, and we're not quite sure how many people would actually be doing this. So. Um, that is a, an option on the table, but a quicker option is probably for a professional society, which the college could be, to issue some kind of certificate of special competency, which honestly has probably as much weight as the paper it's printed on and the organization that stands behind it, so take it for what it's worth. But in fact, it could be a formal education program on the assumption not everybody who, say, does cardiology needs to be an expert in genetics. I guess I look at this, and I think the college does, as sort of concentric circles in a way, with the outer ring being, you might say, all physicians who we hope will have more awareness of genetics and genomics, and the middle one being specialists in different areas, some of whom may be quite expert um, just in the area relevant to their specialty, and at the center, people who are the really um, experts in medical genetics and genomics much more broadly. And for example, if you're going to interpret a whole exome sequence um, done for clinical purposes, you may well need to be at that center target because of the breadth of what could potentially come up that needs to be discussed. Whereas if you're doing a panel of, of exons for cardiomyopathy, um, you could very well function effectively in that middle tier. I think competencies and defining them is going to be, in some ways, the key to getting this off the ground. Great. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, Deborah, did you want to, to comment as well or cover things that you I wanted? think the only reason that CAP fell off the list is because I moved to the University of Vermont kind of right after the meeting and, and was in a tizzy, so I didn't get them connected in with the ISCC, but they are very interested in doing yeah. that. Fantastic. Yeah, Mike, uh, please. Yeah, uh, with the American College of Physicians, the uh, internal medicine organization, we undertook the survey that generated that one to two hours willing to commit. But uh, also in that data, uh, an overwhelming number of the doctors agreed that they needed further education on this, which is um, remarkable and a good sign, I think, because they also told us that they're not seeing this in their practice for the most part. So, so physicians are very practical learners, usually. Uh, what gets on their uh, radar are things that patients are asking them or mm -hmm. they, uh, they have to carry out in their daily practice, but they're, they're, they're watching this and they're interested, I think. Great. I might also note that, that this is a joint effort between the Division of Genomic Medicine at, at NHGRI and the Division of Policy, Communication, and, and Education that uh, Laura Rodriguez um, leads. So this really is an educational effort, and so we're, we're happy to, to involve you. Did you want to uh, comment at all, Laura? Um, I'm not sure that I have anything to add to the, the overview that you gave. I mean, I think that Gene Jenkins and um, others have, have put a lot of effort into our educational outreach. Um, and as was mentioned before, have had great success with some of the um, allied disciplines, but um, reaching into the physician pool has been challenging, and so we're really excited by all the momentum that we're seeing coming out of this group and looking forward to pursuing the activities that have been identified. Great. Okay. I think, uh, I think with that, I'm done. Um, I can't remember who's at 12. Derek. Derek.